All right, everybody, welcome to the UCLA Film Festival 2022. I am Scott Edwards, your host for this panel, and I'm really excited to be here because these four individuals know this industry really well. And uh, on behalf of Entertainment Studies at UCLA, I want to thank everybody for joining us, the people that are joining and the four panelists uh, who have experience in this industry, whether they are producers, directors, in development, attorneys or general counsels or financiers or producers, all very, very formidable in their craft. And we're gonna go through a series of, of questions, Q and A with them and find out what advice they might have to individuals that are trying to break into the industry or grow in the industry or develop a stronger craft if they're already in the industry. So I wanna introduce them really quickly. We have Noemi Ziegler, we have David Weiner, we have Jeanette Milio, and we have Kate Shoemaker. And instead of me tell you all about them, I'd rather them, starting with, let's say, Noemi, I'd rather start with them and have them share a little bit about something about themselves, maybe a project they've worked on recently, a little idea of who they are, what they do, and what they're working on. All right, I guess I'll start. Hi, I'm Noemi Ziegler, and I'm a filmmaker, writer, director, also performer um, with a master's in film directing from the American Film Institute. Um, I've had films and screenplays uh, screened and awarded at various film festivals, uh, including Ann Arbor Film Festival, Student Academy Awards, and South by Southwest. Um, and I teach building an, an online audience at UCLA Extension. So I have uh, promoted, for many years, promoted myself as well as consulted artists and organizations about, um, you know, how to best like engage with and really build out your audience in an authentic, organic way. And finally, I am currently developing a comedy series called Hot Flash about a perimenopausal community college teacher who wants to be a pop star. And it has no relationship to my own life. <laughs> none, none whatsoever. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jeanette. Hi, Scott. Thank you guys for having me today. I'm actually on vacation, so I'm saying hi from Mexico, everyone. <laughs> I'm, as you can hear from my weird accent, actually not from this country, I'm from Germany. I was born and raised there. I worked in the television industry when I started. So I produced television shows, TV series. And then I went into feature films. I worked for studio divisions in Germany, for example, Warner Brothers. I won the green card in 2000. And I moved here and had to literally start from scratch all over again. So I know all the pains we have to go through when we are emerging as producers in an industry that really has a lot of producers. So we kind of stand on the beach departments. So for me, it was the niche of finance that I chose, finance and producing that kind of made it happen for my career. So my focus really is entertainment financing for film and television content. So far, I would say I've produced and financed about 500 hours of content, uh, about 250,000 in production volume and the content that I produced and finance goes through all the known networks and, and studios in the US and also globally. And something that I that was asked here to share that was a highlight was really the moment when I stepped on my very first movie in this country, which was a comedy starring Timothy Dalton, who just came off Mission Impossible and a German actress named Nastasia Kinski. And that little experience already told me that it is important to figure out when you do content, really pay attention to where the money is coming from. And that kind of led me into the finance arena. So I am coming from the financing and producing side, and I teach entertainment finance at UCLA Extension. Ah, awesome. Everyone, everyone attending should take these classes. Um, Kate, you're up. Hello. Um, I come from, I've, I've kind of been on all sides of the uh, creative development producing side of the business. Uh, I started off um, uh, in New York City, uh, in started way off in the beginning in the acting casting world and kind of quickly realized that side was not for me so much and ended up uh, in the producing development world, uh, running a bunch of production companies on the East Coast. Uh, one kind of was for Bob Balaban and has an actor, director, producer, 
a children's book author, he man of many talents, um, where we uh, pre produced uh, Gosford Park and a movie uh, called Bernard and Doris with Susan Sarandon and Ray Fiennes. Um, so I kind of really learned the business from him when I also then got into television, uh, which was very early stages of television when nobody really wanted to do television. It was not the cool thing to do back then. Like and everyone's like, oh, that's really cute. You do TV. Um, and from there, I then went and ran a production deal um, in both film and television um, for a producer uh, at Universal and for NBC, which again, gave me the experience in both television and film, again, before TV was cool. Um, but it gave me kind of a head start on television. So when I came out uh, to Los Angeles uh, about a decade ago, um, I started doing a lot more television than film, which I absolutely loved the kind of faster pace, but I stayed in the film world um, as well, but definitely stuck on the television side a little bit more. More, was a studio executive, a buyer a little bit uh, for a couple of years, then went back into television and film, partnering with Melissa Rosenberg, who wrote all the Twilight movies um, and uh, wrote on Jessica Jones while I was uh, partnering with her at her company. Uh, but we were developing in both worlds at the same time, but, but kind of on a large scale. So it was taking a long time to get these movies made. There, it always takes a long time to get movies made. Uh, but then um, after that, I ran a company at CBS where I set up an executive produced uh, the pilot for Woke on Hulu, uh, which ended up in two seasons uh, just recently. Uh, I think aired in August, September. Um, and then um, right now I'm out on my own and I'm about to start go to, to production on a movie with Tommy Dorfman. And I'm doing a series at E1 uh, we're taking out with uh, Emily Mortimer. So basically a lot of creative uh, development, pitching uh, both in the TV and film world in both production and a lot of selling, a lot of creating and writing and on both sides. Right, awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, you sound very busy. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks. David, you're up. Hey, I'll be, uh, I'll be quick. This is exciting. Glad to be here. You know, when I think about what defines me, probably UCLA Extension. I've taught here for 14 years and nine months, my LinkedIn profile says. So it's pretty crazy. Um, makes me kind of old. But I, I am an entertainment lawyer. Um, I have a passion for teaching. I actually started even before UCLA. Um, today's 9-11, so it's a very heavy day in my heart. And, um, and I want us to, to remind, re make sure that we're reminding ourselves of that. I actually started teaching as a result of 9-11. And I was asked to teach one of the first classes when I was a First Amendment lawyer in New York about the Patriot Act and privacy rights, because I was doing a lot of privacy work. And that led to my teaching a graduate school seminar, which then made me realize that teaching is really where I get all my inspiration that I then take back into the workplace. So I wanna thank all the students who are watching this too. It's really such a mutual relationship, a particular UCLA extension, just, you know, we give a lot to the students, but they really give a lot to us. If anything, just to remind us how exciting it is to be doing what we're doing and to kind of keep that spark alive. But in any event, I started off as a first amendment litigator I'm at a big international firm. I then got sucked into the vortex of talent representation and worked at the two top talent boutiques, one in New York and then in Beverly Hills. I never even wanted to be an entertainment lawyer, actually. Um, I'm an artist and a writer. I've written a whole bunch of books. And when I went to law school, I didn't even know, didn't even really think about entertainment law for the most part. Um, but when I was in New York, a lot of my friends were Broadway actors because I wrote a big book about Broadway. And I just started helping them out. And it became this very organic thing where I was like, oh my God, I actually love being a lawyer where I'm looking out and looking out for artists. And that was kind of how my career organically evolved. Um, after being at firms for a bunch of years, kind of wanted a more dynamic environment. And then I spent the last decade and you know a year of my life at United Talent Agency, which was an incredible experience, really being at the crossroads of everything going on in the industry. And then this year I made a big switch and I'm now the head of business and legal affairs at HarperCollins Productions and also assistant general counsel over there. So really bridging the world of books to TV and film, going back to my roots and being a traditional book lawyer, which is really where so much of my heart is, but then also taking a lot of these book projects and then developing them and turning them into things special while giving the publisher a much more active role in the process. And 
one of the things um, that I'm most excited about, Scott, you know, we recently came together with a, a co-venture relationship with Sony Pictures uh, and Elizabeth Gabler called 3000 Pictures. Um, and uh, uh, we just came out with Where the Crawdads Sing. Um, and that was a special project for me because I actually was Daisy Edgar Jones' lawyer while I was at UTA. And then I made the switch to HarperCollins to find out that, oh my God, HarperCollins co-financed the film. Um, and, is, and is now kind of getting involved in TV and film in really new and exciting ways. And so it's really been great to, to not just be, you know, in the trenches doing my job, but really be at the forefront of, of some really exciting change overall in the landscape of uh, Hollywood and entertainment. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, my wife loved the film. She's a book club. She read the book. They, it was a whole thing. Um, so Kate talked about something. I'm breaking form and, and not asking the first question I plan to ask. Kate had talked about TV used to not be so cool, right? And see, she's shaking her head. It's still, still, we remember those days. Can can each of you, let's start with David. Uh, can each of you talk about changes? Because you're all coming at this from slightly different points of view, maybe some sorts of more severe, but <clears throat> what changes have you seen in this industry that you see as profound? Like Steve Carell, I worked at Crew when they did the poster for 40 year old version, which he attributed to breaking him out. And now you're seeing ads for his new series that's on Hulu. So it's, there's been a lot of change in there. I'd like from each of you, your your perspective on changes you've seen that are significant, because I think we're already in that area. Yeah, I guess starting, I mean, we could spend the next you know 12 hours talking about this. Um, and the changes are ongoing. I think that's one of the most unsettling parts. And one of the things I think everyone needs to recognize when they get into the space is that the landscape is always changing. I mean, and it's changing fast and every year, changes faster and faster. You know, I think one of the big draws of TV, as we've always seen, is that's where that's where there's always been that chance to really hit the jackpot. Um, and then with the proliferation of all these different streaming platforms and the way that people want a more sustained relationship with their characters and, and storylines, and they can often get from a two hour film and the emotional resonance of all of that, I think culturally um, we've shifted in that direction. Um, I think there are a lot of challenges, particularly now, even more so when developing um, TV. And one of the things that's so heartbreaking about it for so many of us, particularly as the producers, is it used to be that if you produced a great TV show that was everyone was talking about and getting rave reviews, that people are going to keep on making it. Um, and now when these TV shows go off to the streamers, they have a very different thought process. They're looking at what's the content that they're going to spend money on to get them more subscribers. And it's, it's a little bit divorced from necessarily giving people what's celebrated and what they like. And I think one of the things that for those of us who have worked on TV shows and gone through the excitement of having a show picked up, and then the, the shock and the horror of when a successful show just doesn't get that green light to go ahead for a second season with no really articulable explanation to it. Um, it's heartbreaking. And I think that's one of the things when I think of TV, as exciting as it is, um, you know, it can be very, very heartbreaking, even for the most successful of us in the space. Right. Kate, would you like to add to that or expand on it? Uh, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with David, uh, but, you know, I think that truly one of the the only things that is uh, completely predictable about the entertainment industry is that it is constantly changing and will change, uh, you know, probably as soon as you figure it out, it's probably going to change, you know, pretty, pretty shortly from when you figured it out. Uh, and I think really, I mean, I, I, I have a, I won't probably, I won't mention who, but I remember picking up the phone in 2008 and asking if some, an actor will be a part of this really big project. And the agent said, you know, that actor will never do TV. Mark my words, that actor will never do television. And then, you know, that actor, you know, might have a hard time actually right now getting a TV show. And I think that that is the ever, you know, never say never, the, the ever changing nature of the business. Uh, is it's just unpredictable. And I think that keeping an open mind and and creative mind in terms of seeing what's next and and just following the content and following the the great idea and following what's going to intrigue people and be exciting to people uh, is probably 
the only way that you can follow the the not trends, but is to follow your instincts because really following trends and following is is not going to really help you very much because it's going to it's going to change next year. It's going to change in two years. Um, it's it's really following the content that I feel like has always served me the best. Right. That's hugely important. I remember an executive at Fox saying, I don't care what the ratings are. I don't care if they watch it on linear or on streaming. I care that they watch it. I care that they see it at some point in time. And we got to make content that they want to see. Yeah. So and I mean, and, and then to Diva's point again, I and mean, sometimes that also, you know, at the end of the day, they, you can't, so many, it is at the end of the day, super subjective. And so you sometimes never understand why people make the, mis the choices they make. But the best that you can do is say, I did make a good show. It was good content. I have an audience that liked it. And, you know, what, where, why ever they made the idea that the, the reasons that they did, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. But if you, if you get it made, you know, that that is still a really good, a good, you know, a good thing that happened because that's really hard to do. Um, but it's possible if you follow the content, I think is the best way to do it. Yeah, that's quite an accomplishment, no matter what it is. Um, Jeanette, what are some changes you've seen? You know, I've seen them actually very close up because as a financier, first of all, I want to say I agree with Kate and I agree with David in Kate in regards to saying the story is the most important part of anything. It doesn't matter if it's a movie or a TV show. Story has to be good, has to be outstanding today, even than any time I've ever produced anything over the last 20 years that I've produced and financed. But here's where, as a financing producer, I did see the changes. So the first thing, I was producing these Halle Berry movies, Jason Statham movies. We were spending $20, 25000000 million on these movies. If I would make the same movie today, the same story, the same script, the same shooting location, I would have to make them for half the budget. And the reason is, because of all these changes, because of the streamers coming into the business, the license fees that are paid by these buyers, by network stations all over the world, including the US, are less. Mm -hmm. So now I have to figure out how am I feasible? How am I gonna get this movie made for an amount that makes sense, not just for the buyers that buy my film in the US and internationally, but also for my investors who are paying for the production costs. They have to make their money back as well. So that was the time when first that model entirely disappeared. No more movies for at least three years. When Netflix came in, it was impossible to get pre-sales done. It was impossible to get any movies made. It didn't even matter who was in it. So we all freaked out on the independent producing side. Even big producers that did 20, $30 million movies, they were standing in the dark, didn't know where to go. And then the whole television development came about. Now, I come from television. I love television. To me, it's never been a stepchild. I love it. I love storytelling. Television gives me the option to tell a beautiful story for the longest time. Now, here are the opportunities. And they came up. More television content was in demand, not just from actually networks, but really from the streamers. So now what we focused on is putting money into television. And that became a thing because they are buying, the buyers all around the world are buying network uh, uh, television shows, the streamers are buying television shows. And now it comes down to, someone mentioned this earlier, what happens if they don't like it after season three? Well, here are the options. You can do things like co-production deals with a, a network or a streamer. You can do things like split, split rights deals where you know the streamer or the domestic buyer takes the domestic rights, meaning the US, and you as a producer keep the international rights. So there are different ways that we can do deals today that you know a, a successful series, even if it's canceled, can continue. There was actually an example, and I don't know if you guys know Baywatch, but Michael Burke actually did exactly that. And it's not just now, but it was already happening then when a, a network decided we don't want to continue yeah, and Michael Burke said, I'm going to go out. Could you find it? I'll make it for you. I'm sorry. Uh, he, he muted, he muted. Was, he accidentally had his mic up. Oh, sorry about that. You're good, All you're I'm good. saying, long story short is, the opportunity today is to look at content from different angles and find buyers early. And when I say buyers, I'm talking about domestic partners like the streamers and the network stations, but also international buyers that, you know, like was even in Germany or Constantine or any of these parties outside of the country that are eager to buy or pre-buy certain rights for film and television content today. Right, right. There is Scott, Scott, can I jump in there? Because there's one quick point here. I just want to, it's such an important point, Jeanette, that you brought up. And and of course, the name of the game when you're in TV is if you just license it to a streamer and then you're able to retain the rights to then license it elsewhere. But one of the 
bigger trends that we're seeing too is a lot of these streamers wanting a worldwide grant of rights and just that key core question of how you structure it. Are you giving the people who distribute the project first all the rights throughout the world or are you giving them a piece of the rights for a limited period of time with holdbacks and then giving you that opportunity and as we see these streamers constantly changing in their approaches there i mean that can make all the difference in the world between whether or not a project gets financed or not and whether or not anyone's going to make any money from it i also think it has to do with the content david you know some projects streamers might want everything and other projects are like yeah we'll take the domestic and we're fine it really has to do with what do they want? What is the piece of content? That is my experience. And I would like to go into a streamer. Being a financing producer, I would like to go into the streamer and the network and say, okay, here are your options. If you don't want to pay for everything, here is something we can do to just get it made. If you want it all, okay, I'll take your money. That's fine too. But I just want you know people out there to know a no doesn't necessarily mean a no. There are ways to get these things done in different structures today, which I believe is just... A beautiful thing and a beautiful development. Yeah, Noemi, with your uh, with your online audience building audience building experience, uh, are some of these ideas resonating? Are you seeing this from another point of view? Yeah, just to offer a perspective as a performer and also um, in terms of social media, I think it's an incredibly exciting time for new voices, for fresh female voices for underrepresented voices. So it's unbelievably exciting. Um, it's all about great story. And of course, finding your own unique way of like, way into a, a story. So um, so TV to me is, is incredibly exciting. Um, you can look at examples. So for students, um, I feel like it's great to look at examples of filmmakers who uh, may have started out, for example, with a YouTube show like an Issa Rae, who was able to leverage that into her own first series, Insecure. Um, you know, Rachel Bloom was successful with hilarious videos before doing Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. And another exciting example, totally different, is um, Justin Simeon, who created Dear White People. That started essentially as um, he was tweeting in the voice of the protagonist. So he literally was finding his voice as a storyteller and his character's voice, this female voice on Twitter. Um, and then a trailer that he produced himself um, went viral, which is really how he raised financing for the movie. And then, you know, it became a Netflix series. So, so that's my perspective is really for people to really look in, to explore their own voice through through writing and also playing with social media. It's, a, it's the perfect place to really explore yourself, how you authentically connect to people, you know, what is your, in a sense, branding and finding your audience. It's all this organic process. If you're doing it right and you're not just, you know, the horrible curse of social media is feeling like I need to have Five million followers. I need. Do I need to pay for bots and whatever people to follow me? But if you really believe in that, you're using it as an authentic way to find your voice and connect and find your community out there. Uh, I think it's a brilliant way to develop projects and hopefully end up w whether it's in films or TV. Right. That that connects to a great TED talk from uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt about the difference between paying attention on the craft you're, you're developing and the thing you're doing versus just trying to get attention. And one of them coming, it's really great if you guys have a chance to check it out. Uh, that actually, what you just said, it connects to the advice question, which we have to ask because we want the students on here to get something out of it, besides what they've already received in the, in the knowledge you're dropping. And that is, is there, after the pandemic, you know, post pandemic, assuming we're tail end going into a little bit more, a lot more normal, is there a specific advice which might connect to what you just talked about, developing your idea and finding that voice and using social um, avenues to, to get interest? Is there advice that any of you would have for filmmakers, storytellers, people that want to get into television or streaming or just share their stories as to how they could do that post-pandemic and how the world might be a little bit different after the pandemic? We can start whomever would like to go first. Or I can call on people. I'm trying to be mindful. 
Kate's ready. She took her mic. You know, off. yeah. I mean, I can kind of piggyback off that a little bit because, you know, I I work with a variety of of I mean, I I'm always open to working with new voices. In fact, I enjoy it. I've always kind of enjoyed mentoring, you know, new voices and figuring out a way to package, you know, again, follow the content. And but I really encourage anybody, even if it's not a new voice. I mean, I've I've kind of reverse engineered a lot. And I, I think that it's it's not a bad idea. And I'm curious what David has to say about this. Uh, you know, to reverse engineer sometimes when you have an idea, especially in this type of environment, where you have so many creative resources that aren't a script on a desk, you know, because we've had 20 years of scripts on desk, I mean more than that, 20, you know, a pile of scripts on desk or treatments and this, that, and the other thing. Um, and I think that especially even just the the type of executives now that are reading these things uh, and the attention span that people have there I mean I would have been so excited for something like you know YouTube or social media when I was a young uh, younger budding executive or producer and I think that to have these resources take advantage of it uh, do what you know Naomi was saying in terms of Rachel Bloom and all these re reverse engineer your IP if you have a great idea instead of going right to script, or if even if you have a script, think about, okay, I have a script. Instead of maybe just sending it out to a bunch of, you know, to the town, how can I maybe re go back and is there a, you know, do I wanna maybe write a graphic novel instead so that I can send this out as IP or do I wanna write a short story about this idea so that I have actual IP instead of just an idea? Because an idea is a really difficult thing just to sell. I mean, I have an idea, I'm gonna sell it uh, because a lot of people have ideas and it seems like we all have a very conscious collective brain because a lot of people have the same ideas. But, you know, after the pandemic, especially, it is just a lot more difficult and I, I never want to you know tell people not to be in this business because it's 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 so fun and if you know how to if you get to do it and you're doing it successfully it's just a lot of hard work so you just have to work hard at it and work hard at it every day and do it for a long time work hard at it every day but I think be creative at doing it so I think trying to really think outside the box and do these different types of think about different things in scripts right off the bat or treatments. Think about how you can be creative with your ideas. There's so many different ways nowadays uh, that that would be really my first thought process. And again, I think re kind of going back and sometimes, I mean, a, a lot of projects you'd be surprised and I can't think of them off the top of my head have kind of been an idea first and then gone back into be a graphic novel before they ended up being a script. Um, or, start, you know, so I, again, I think that that is without me talking again, I can talk about this stuff for like 12 hours. Uh, but so that that I think is one way after the pandemic to get more creative with your with your ideas right off the bat. Love it. We're going to extend the remix of this panel. We're going to do a 12, 12 hour, 24 hour. <laughs> uh, Jeanette, thoughts on on advice for filmmakers oh, yeah. in you know, post pandemic? Where do I end the list? How much, how much time do we have? But I'm going to kind of second what Kate says. I think this is a time where really daring, fun, out there ideas can find a place. So I really think, you know, we don't have to be in that box. I remember when I started in the 90s, it had to be like that thriller and that action thing. And I could really not go out of that box. And now it's like, where do I even end? Any stories can, can matter. And the more diverse they are and the more authentic they are and the more you go out of the box the more chances believe it or not you'll have to sell that thing at least with us for me it's also and i'm what i'm doing right now is i work a lot on television shows that are based on book series so i'm focusing on uh, existing ip not just novels but right now i'm actually working on a show we're putting together that's um, on a scientific book, which, you know, is a little bit different. But the, the fact of the matter is there are so many ideas out there, yes, but who, how do you know it's the right one? I think understanding what's what you see today and you see very diverse characters. You're not just seeing the bad guy that's just the bad guy. You see the bad guy that's also the good guy and somewhere in the middle. You see the good guy that's the bad guy and somewhere in the middle. These diverse characters, they're so multifaceted, knowing how to write them in a way that you can live and breathe them, I think that's important. And to develop that as a producer, not just, I'm talking not just about the writer, but the producers also have a responsibility to lead the writer in developing those kind of characters. 
So that to me is important. But I also will come back to the basics here. Understand the industry, do some research, read the trades, go to the main film festivals, the Cannes Film Festival, the AFM is around the corner. It has amazing seminars and panels that talk about the state of the industry today. Not only do you hear about what's going on, you're going to see who the players are and go up to them and say, okay, here's what I'm doing. You know, do you have advice? And they're always open to mentoring people. Do an internship. Right now I have two actually interns from my last UCLA class working with me. One is an amazing financial brain, which is in my class, maybe not unusual because I teach entertainment finance, but the other person is extremely creative and just looks at stories from a different point of view. Now, for me, doing both finance and developing stories, these kids are fantastic. I'm saying kids, they're of course not kids, but the point is do internships, learn from those who do this every day, be a sponge do everything. I mean, I started this industry as an assistant. I worked my way up in every position you can think of. And I think it's important to know all that surrounds our industry, not just one part of it, not just one job in it. Just try to learn as much as you can. And then when you get that first movie that you pitch somewhere and you have that first pitch deck that lands somewhere, take the deal. Even if it's not the perfect deal, do the deal. You'll get to the perfect deal later when you're in the level of the Spielbergs and so forth. But take the deal make it happen and try to make things happen and learn constantly. So being a sponge, I think is important. Making connections is important. And when you do the CCLA classes, not work with the people that are in your course because you know they're in your course today. They might be working at Amazon tomorrow. You never know. Networking is extremely important. And as we saw from the party that you probably visited yesterday, there is an amazing abundance of interesting people that can be mentors, but also can be people that you work with in the future. So networking, I think is key as well. Awesome. I'm going to run out of paper. And Scott, uh, I'll, I'll jump in there because yeah. there's a, a deal-making point I want to emphasize. And anyone who's taken my class, I teach them the class I've taught, I think now for over 10 years straight, um, legal primer for the entertainment business. Um, and it's a very hands-on class. It's about um, you know coming out of there with actual skills, um, teaching you how to option underlying rights, something that we talked about as being important here. And one of the reasons that I moved over to one of the biggest book publishers in the world is because we're sitting on 200 years of the greatest content ever written. And when you look at where Hollywood is shifting, it's definitely going to, you know, finding books and finding the underlying source material, which can give people more confidence and have a built in audience that are going to be able to have people return phone calls in a way that they maybe would not if it was just some original idea, despite how genius and beautiful it might be. Um, I'll say one thing about deals. Don't just sign the first deal because you have to understand, I talk about this in my class too. Anytime anyone offers a deal or sends over an agreement, chances are it's just an agreement or deal terms for their side and not you. And everything takes negotiation. You're never going to kill a deal by going and pushing back in a fair and reasonable way and asking questions about how this relationship is going to unfold. So one of the things I really emphasize in my class is making sure that everyone has the confidence to really look at a deal, even if it's your first one, and don't just sign. There's this tendency to just want to sign and celebrate, but you could really, really do damage to yourself. And, and to be honest, it gives you an opportunity to show off your professionalism by engaging in the negotiating process. You know, one of the, my favorite students I ever had at UCLA Extension, we talk about advice. Um, his name was Jean de Miron. I think I'm pronouncing it right. We're still friends because I love keeping in contact with students as much as I can. And he went off and produced a short, La Femme and the Je Te Veux, which got him an Academy Award nomination. And now he's working for Roland Emmerich and is one of like, he's a member of the Academy. I mean, this guy is like this rising star amongst rising stars. And a lot of that came out of being at UCLA Extension. And he'll be the first to admit that. And, and so when it comes to advice, there are two things that he always was, in addition to making a short, which I think is essential for anyone who's looking to be a filmmaker, because people don't even read their own clients' material very often. <laughs> we have assistants do that, right? And so we're in a visual world. If you have a 10-minute engaging short, chances are they're going to maybe get around to clicking on that if it's a secure link, then to reading a you know 110-page screenplay. So you know you always have to be thinking about about that. And the two words that would come to mind are you have to be professional and you have to be strategic. 
um, about everything that you do. And that goes for social media as well. I'm, you know, I, I like social media. I've been active in that space a bit and have a lot of friends who are, but I think you have to be very careful with just being too creative on, on social media without having any kind of filter of professionalism on there, because this will be stuff that is out there forever. And if someone's Googling you or trying to get a sense of what your tastes are, and you have a whole bunch of developmental sketches and stuff out there, which may or may not be to everyone's liking, um, you could actually you know, do yourself some harm. So I think you need to always be very careful about that. And we live in this day and age where it's it's super easy to, to film something and get something out there. But I do think that it really needs to be carefully curated. Um, and then when it comes to, again, like I said earlier, you know, underlying content is key. I'm getting life rights. If you're doing, even though you don't necessarily always need life rights, something I talk about in my class is that, People often do things in Hollywood that there's low, that there's zero legal necessity for. They just do it out of habit because a lot of people in Hollywood don't think, but it also creates a bit of a foundation that you can build a project off of. And it gives you the opportunity to call up a big fine air and say, hey, I have the life rights to someone, even though we don't really need them. Let's talk about this new project that I want to develop with you. And it's all about getting in the door and building those relationships and being a part of a community such as UCLA Extension, which I've been so proud to be a part of for 14 years, almost 15, um, using LinkedIn well, um, and just being, you know, being a professional, like don't, the second you're in this industry, you're in this industry and every conversation you have and every relationship that you make matters and could be that one that organically takes you to where you want to go. Now, the last thing I'll say is this. Just like we hate when people label us, the worst thing that we do in the entertainment space is we label ourselves. Sometimes in this bizarre hyphenate fashion without having ever done anything, we're a writer, producer, director, actor, you ask someone what they've done and they're like, uh, student work? No, you don't, you have to earn that hyphen in my opinion. You don't just throw all those labels on there because it makes it too confusing for Hollywood to kind of really understand too. So you have to, you know, you have to be very strategic about everything that you do um, and, and you got to learn and you have to keep on being engaged in the process and building out that community because you never know where you're going to go. People who think they're starting off as a producer might end up being a director. They might end up being a writer. They might end up being an actor. And so it's important to absorb as much information as you can. One of the things I'm passionate about in my class, Gene's class, the other programs you have at UCLA Extension is we're so quick to say, hey, I'm a director, I'm a producer, but you don't really know yet. You haven't really been in the trenches. You haven't really done that work yet. So you don't know how your career is going to pivot. And I look at my career and my professional journey. And, you know, while I am currently in my dream job, I'm so proud to say, all the places I've gone and the things that I've done were never things that I could have ever really imagined or really yearned for. They just were inevitabilities due to my keeping my momentum going in a large part by constantly learning. Um, and I think that's really the key. And even when you look at big A-list stars, you know, sometimes they're the ones that you want to sit down their lawyer and talk about every single provision in the agreement because they want to know what's in it. And they're not the lawyer, they're not negotiating it, but they don't put their head in the sand either. And those right. are often the people that end up being the most successful. Right, right. I want, to, I want to say something, David. I didn't suggest that I want them to not sign the deal or sign the deal. Here is my experience. I work with a lot of independent producers who might just emerge in the industry. So they're newer. The one thing that I find a little frustrating being on the other side, having to give them the money for their movie, is when they're nitpicking. Of course, you need a lawyer. The first agreement I send is, of course, geared towards me. And it's going to be the same for a studio or a network or streamer that sends the client, the producer, the agreement. I totally agree with you. They need to have a strong lawyer. Absolutely right. The point I was trying to make is the deals, they don't always have to be perfect because you have to do some compromising here. They want something. I want something. Right. And the likelihood is we're going to meet somewhere in the middle. There is no such thing like I'm going to get my perfect deal or they're going to get their perfect deal because it is a compromise in the end of the day. That's what I was suggesting. No, but absolutely. No, we're, no we're, we're on the same page. Absolutely. Okay, no, good. I was just kind of, trust me, we're, <laughs> you and I, I have, I have okay, tremendous God. admiration and respect. I know we're on the same page, but it's, it's weird. Sometimes, like even as a lawyer, I do this for a living. Someone presents an agreement to me. And my first instinct is, oh, I'm going to sign it. 
Like even as an author, I'm like, what am I doing? I do this for a living. You know, I need to go and actually read this stuff because, because it is really important. And we sometimes all get caught up in wanting that adrenaline rush, right? Of signing something. Um, and again, it, it again points out the reason just to go back why I'm so passionate about teaching and teaching entertainment law is because very often, you know, the key to getting anything done is setting up development. And unfortunately, when you set up development, as you know, as we all know, only a small percentage of projects in development actually get made. So how do you set up a project in development if only a small percentage of those things get made and not bankrupt yourself by having to hire an outside lawyer who is nitpicking, as you said, and making it more about them than it is about the client, which it often is, and having this massive disconnect for fighting over things that only matter to the lawyer billing his or her hours, all right? Yet they've convinced themselves and they've drank their Kool-Aid or their spinthrift, <laughs> yum, right? And they've convinced themselves that they're actually fighting harder than anyone else when really all they're doing is billing you and then the project doesn't go anywhere, which is why there is this information gap, right? For all these people who are starting off, that's why your class is important. I think my class is pretty critical because you're often making these deals that you can't just sign. And it's also, unless you're a trust fund kid, it's not feasible for you to be spending 10 or $20,000, if not more on some lawyer going back and forth on some stuff, some of which matters, a lot of it doesn't. And that's that kind of, you know, that's where a program like UCLA Extension really makes a difference. Not that this is an advertisement for it, but I've spent 15 years of my life teaching. So I'm proud of it, right? And this is what we do. We fill in that gap where people otherwise aren't going to get the expertise or exposure to people like us on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but are going to learn the skills to like be able to look out for themselves better off than they would otherwise. So... I'm calling both of you because I'm currently negotiating my contract at Fox. Um, and we also had an employee yeah. connecting to your professional strategic advice. We had an employee who's no longer there and they just answered a question on social media. Someone had asked this question, what's it like to be a young person working at a company that had older people? That was the question. And they answered it on social media and they posted their answer and they read specific emails from their own teammates and from their bosses. They reported to somebody who reported to me and that person came to me and said, hey, this was posted on social media. And they were so specific in some of their mockery, if you will, that HR was brought in. And within two days, that person was dismissed. And I think it's important to understand that professionalism and the lawyers and the HR representatives said this thing. If you remove the word old and said, what's it like to be a white person you're working at a company with black people? Or what's it like to be a straight person working for someone who's gay? Or what's it like to be? And they started naming all the protected classes. And they said, you would never tolerate this for anything else. Why would you tolerate it for a comment about older people? And so they went, they, and it was a sad thing because it was an employee who was talented and they were just trying to <clears throat> respond to something on social media, get some likes and, or engage, but they didn't stop and think, wait a second, this is not going to paint me in the best light. And they ended up losing their job because of it. So that's a very real thing you're saying. Uh, and no, no, I mean, I'm bringing this back your way. And asking the question, what is it that you look for in possible filmmakers or people you would want to partner with on a project? You know, what are the characteristics you're looking for from them? Well, I think um, I, my brain is still wanting to answer some of those. I'm going to tie this all together if I can. Uh, I think that um, relationships are everything. So, I mean, from for students breaking into the industry. Um, it's all about re developing relationships over many years. Even if you get a rejection, it's not about the rejection. It's about what can I learn from that? Can I still keep in touch with this person as a mentor, as a resource? Everybody you meet at UCLA and everywhere else is, it's unbelievable. If you look at Daniel's, um, you know, everything everywhere all at once, those guys, met at a film school or technically maybe it was an art school started developing wacky projects for years did short films did music videos did turn down for what like they were all about just finding like their own unique absurd crazy what can we pull off on small budgets and here they are and i feel like everything is about those relationships 
Um, at AFI in my year, I had numerous examples like Darren Aronofsky with his cinematographer, Matthew Libatique, you know, starting on student projects together. So it's like a big part of it is all about um, having those relationships. So who would I want to work with? It's often former students, it's often colleagues, it's often people that I connect obviously creative with, creatively, and somebody who's not in their ego, which is hard because I, I got my own ego to deal with, so I can't deal with other people's. Not to, and I have to learn, <laughs> it's a learning process for me to not, I mean, in terms of the not getting nitpicky with legal matters, I think that goes along with a larger idea that you're serving a larger project, you're serving a vision, not your own ego, hopefully. So you can become somebody that can work with people. Um, you're not obsessing and paranoid that, uh, you know, like I can't share my script because someone's gonna steal it. Unfortunately, there's a reality that people are gonna look at things. So I feel like you, you can't completely nitpick and be a diva. You have to just want to make stuff. I mean, that's just my own, perspective. So, but I wanted to just sort of touch on a couple other ideas in terms of like with social media, if I'm working with people, I want to work with people that have, uh, you know, develop their own voice, know who they are and, and some ideas for that. So for students, the IP thing is so crucial. So maybe you have a short film, maybe you have a script, can you do something like a podcast? Can you create, you know, graphic novel, anything else? There are so many ways where you can not only build an audience, develop some organic following, which makes other people want to work with you, but um, you can also find yourself in the process and offer something to people. So for example, if I'm calling people, cold calling people for favors, that seems a lot less exciting for them as if I say, do you, can I interview you on my podcast? I'm providing a forum for you. And yeah. that's everything social media now is about providing value. So what am I actually providing for other people? Is it entertainment? Is it educating people be, like about the process of making my movie, the process of knocking on doors, you know, so like, I have to be providing value to a community. So there's a thousand ways to do it in a genuine way, not in a hacky way and stay professional mm -hmm. at the same time. My final little comment was, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> don't take rejection. I mean, in other words, maybe take two rejections. The second one, maybe give up or don't but don't be crazy about it. But like, it's so much about rejection. We have to just continue to put ourselves out there and get better and take notes and be, you know, and learn and accept that there's gonna be a thousand rejections for one positive. So keep going. If this is your passion, keep living your passion. A hundred percent. Okay, hey, Scott, Scott, there's oh, one. Here, yeah. I always love jumping in with teaching moments because Naomi brought up so many great points. Podcasts are fantastic. And by the way, when I was responding to Jeanette, I wasn't saying that you shouldn't read your agreements and hire a lawyer if you can, because you should, because podcast is a great example, right? Of like, what is nitpicking and what is not from a legal perspective, right? And it's, it requires a really smart lawyer or someone who knows what they're doing to make that distinction. I, I've recently had a bunch of situations, not currently in my job, but in the past, where we had someone create some underlying content and then they decided to put together a podcast exactly as you're saying, right? To try to get some more exposure for it. The person didn't really read the writing of the podcast agreement. Then it turned out these podcast producers attached themselves as producers of anything derivative of the podcast. And it made it almost impossible to set up the underlying work because on page 14 in the miscellaneous section, there was some language that which allowed, even though people thought it was just a one-off for a podcast, allowed these podcast producers to be along for the ride for anything else that essentially comes out of the work. So that's why you have to be careful, right? It's like, you got to read stuff because you never know where it is. It could be one sentence. It could be one word that's there or it's not. 
that makes the difference between whether or not a project moves forward. And I've seen it come down to that. So you have to be careful. When you talk about nitpicking and you talk about over lawyering, that exists 100%. It's about understanding what the real actionable provisions are, what is likely to happen and how the provisions speak to that and making sure you understand everything. And, and the best trick, the best um, thing I teach in my class, if I could break it down to one sentence, is if you're going through an agreement and the other side presents it to you, go through every paragraph and say, hey, I don't understand this. Can you explain it to me? Right? And then the other side is going to like look at it and try to articulate it. They're often not even going to know what it means. And without you even knowing what to ask for, they'll often say, oh, this doesn't belong or, oh my God, we could change that. And it's amazing how much fluidity there actually is within the negotiating process. Or you look at something and you say, I don't understand, is this fair? Now, the sense of what's fair in Hollywood is very different than the sense of what is fair to the average person walking down Hollywood Boulevard, right? But at the end of the day, it's about being able to articulate that relationship and what happens when things in the future may or may not happen and making sure that you're, you're on board with that. And because it can be, can make all the difference. Yep, absolutely. Kate, I want to throw this last question, which I think we're getting close to the end here. Um, your way, which is, because it connects to, I mean, everybody's got a, a wealth of experience and an unpredictable trajectory and pathway to where you are now. But the question of what advice you'd have to people that are that get in the industry and are working in order to continue succeeding and thriving, like you've worn many hats and you've tried many different things, and it sounds like you've succe succeeded and excelled at those, but you've not stopped pushing and striving and growing. And I just wonder what what advice you'd have for people in the industry. Once you're in it, don't you know plateau. How do you keep moving? Um, yeah, I, um, hmm. yeah, no, I mean, I think part of it is it goes to, uh, you know, also what, you know, David said at the beginning, which is, you know, I, I started as an actress, uh, that I got, went, I went to, you know, school for an actress. I got out, uh, you know, I was like, I'm an actress. Then I went to some auditions and I was like, no, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then I went into casting because, well, I thought when I was into, got into casting, then maybe they would just, I could skip auditioning because the casting people would be like, yeah, you should be an actress. Just come on over. We'll hire you to be an actress. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, but then on the casting side, I realized I wanted to be kind of a bigger piece, a little bit of, of the, I didn't want to be on that side. I wanted to be on this side. I wanted to kind of be a little bit of a bigger piece. And then in casting and callbacks, I saw these very stressed out people coming in, in the hallway, trying to figure out what, where the location fell through and why this person had been paid. And I said, who's that stressed out person in the hallway? And they said, that's the producer. And I said, I want to be the stressed out person in the hallway. Uh, and that's how I ended up getting into producing uh, because that I was, you know, that that's literally how I got into producing because I didn't know what that meant um, from the acting side. And so it kind of fell into it. But, you know, again, as David said, I just didn't kind of allow myself to go, get trapped in one place and I kept my mind open um, and then just kept following my, uh, that, you know, and this is kind of a good thing too. The minute I realized I wanted to be a producer, I just said, okay, well, I'm just going to produce. And I went up to Columbia in, in New York and I put a piece of paper on the bulletin board and said, I'll produce your grad, your grad films for free. And I got a bunch of calls, <laughs> a lot of calls. Uh, and I produced two of uh, my, this woman reached out to me and said, do you want to help me produce my grad films? And I said, yes. And so I produced two of our grad films, um, at one at my parents' house. Uh, one of them was Alicia was with, with Alicia Reiner, who's an actress actually now on Orange is the New Black, and she's been on Better Things. And, you know, but this was like, 20 years ago. And so, you know, this is how things start to move. And I made this relationship and that relationship. And, and so she happened to know of Bob Balaban, who was hiring and I got a job there. And so this is kind of where you start. And that's all because I just put a piece of paper on a bulletin board saying, I want to be a producer. And so I think that that is partially how you want something. 
I think stay, you know, it's not going to happen if you sit in your apartment and you go, I want to be something. So hopefully someone will come and give it to me. You know, you really have to work at it and be creative how you're going to do it. And a lot of the times you just have to do it. Um, and you have to figure out a way that you make it happen for yourself in a really creative way. And, you know, towards what Jeanette and David have been saying too, I didn't get paid to do any of these movies. I had to figure out how to do it on the Columbia grad thing, um, get snacks at Kmart, which was the place that existed at that point. Um, and, you know, and then kind of work it out on my own. And I certainly would have, it was very, very hard. And I probably could have walked away once I saw how much it was going to maybe cost me, but it gave me the experience. And so anyway, moving on from there, I wanted buying experience because I thought maybe that's what I want to do. I should get that. And the worst thing, the best thing that will do for me is make me better at producing is to be a buyer. And I want to be at least better at buying at being a producer if buying isn't for me. So win, win. And so that's what I did. I went to be a buyer and it wasn't necessarily for me because I kept getting in trouble lying on my office floor working with writers for too many hours on projects. And so I went back to producing and buying, being on the buying side made me a better producer uh, because at the end of the day, knowledge is confidence. And to what everybody's been saying here, there is no such thing as knowing too much, reading the trades and reading all the new scripts and then watching them on television. So you see what, you know, how they either were better than the script or maybe they didn't end up better than the script or why something didn't get made. These are all ways to then be able to go out into the world and be fluid and know who people are and feel really confident um, that you belong in the world because you've been doing the work. And I think that that also really makes a big difference um, just to you feeling really good about the conversations you're having um, and knowing, oh, I read that project. I read that script. Oh, aren't you this person? Aren't you that person? And I think that that really also makes a, a big difference. So I don't know if that necessarily answered the question, yeah. but I've been wanting to say all those things. So <laughs> it does. And I've, you know, I've been taking crazy notes over here and I had written down mindset more than once because every one of you have talked about having advising people or, or giving the suggestion, have an open mindset, have a mindset that is not fixed in the fact that my solution or my path to success is this one particular way. There are many different ways to get there. And it's important to make sure that people are willing to try new things, to learn the industry from all these different points of view. Uh, it's really, really great advice. I'm going to steal all of it and put it in my class. I hope you guys know that. I'm just here to plagiarize. Um, Noemi, I want to, like Kate, you, you've navigated your career from a couple different perspectives. And how do you keep pushing? I know you have that project in development that you said is completely fictitious, not based on anybody you know. Nothing. But how do, yeah, yeah, how do you keep pushing? What, what keeps you motivated? Honestly, I feel like I want to say everyone has their own weird path in show business. And it's so if you feel like yours is tough and hard to navigate, it's normal. At least for me, one of the things that grounds me is um, teaching for some, for other people, it could be something totally different. Um, anything where I can continue to learn um, and learn from other people, younger creative minds. I mean, to me, that's so exciting. I'm like a kid, so I'm always um, wanting to make new things. I'm always wanting to watch new things and learn from younger people. So basically, um, that is my that is the thing that keeps me uh, keeps me sort of. I feel like at least aware of what's happening at TikTok. <laughs> I'm not saying I'll ever understand it, but oh, but I no, think but that's important. I just think it, yeah, kind of along with, I think what Kate was just saying, um, yeah, reading the trades, watching TikTok, literally like everything out there and being curious about what is happening with media because it is changing. But then again, I just, um, I feel like you have to just listen to sort of you really have to listen to your inner voice and not get overwhelmed by the noise and figure out why am I doing this again? Why do I wake up every day with some weird desire maybe to tell stories? 
and ultimately it's about that it's about you know like you have to honor your own passion and not worry about anything else any uh, what people think of you what you know rejection just sort of like take it slow you know you don't have to be a superstar tomorrow you may never have to you just have to kind of honor that fire inside of you um i hope that was an answer that's a great answer jeanette i, I want to ask this question that is people come to you maybe and say hey you got some money maybe help me finance this thing right you're in the world of entertainment finance is there yeah, a i am so Holy are there are there characteristics or qualities you look for in when you partner with somebody, you know, about the story or about the individual that's trying to tell a story or the reason behind it? Are there are there certain things that you're like, I gravitate toward these types of projects or these individuals? I'm not so quick to want to invest or raise the money for this sort of thing. Is there any sort of way you approach it? Yes, first of all, I want to second what Kate and Naomi said, which is something about instincts. When someone pitches something to me, and usually it's a producer or writer or director or a combination of it all, or even an actor. I had an actress in my class who was fairly known, and she came and pitched a project, had a producer on it. To me, it's really about be excited about it. So when Naomi mentions, and Kate said the same thing, this excitement, this enthusiasm that, that kind of transfers over to me. And I don't really care if it's my student that comes and has a great idea, or if it's uh, one of my producers that I work with who has done a fit load of movies with the studio system and now wants to go independent because they want to keep retaining rights. So it doesn't really matter where the story comes from, to be honest with you, Scott. It is the story that matters, and it is the enthusiasm that I sense that it is delivered with because it's engaging. And I think it's not just me, I think it's also other industry executives that are on the acquisition side that want to feel that engagement and that authenticity in, in someone pitching their idea, because it's really about not just the story, you're investing in them. And it's not just me saying this, I'm investing in them, it's any investor in any industry, they're first and foremost investing in the person. And of course, they're investing in the idea, but the idea can be molded. So when you come to me, no matter if it's a student or it doesn't really matter with a good idea that I feel has good bones. And I think there is a there there for someone wanting to, you know, sleeves up and go in there with me and make it happen. I will make it happen because there is two of us that can now work on the story and making the project happen. But there needs to be someone on the other side who's willing. They also have to understand this is teamwork. I don't make these movies by myself anymore. I don't make the TV shows by myself. It's teamwork. So someone comes to me and pitches something. I'm going to be part of their team. They're going to be part of my team. And the egos need to stay out in front of the door. The ego thing is something we all experience in Hollywood. So it's not really serving the project all that well in general. And someone mentioned this earlier. So checking that at the door is usually a good thing. And I will respond to someone who supports the project probably more likely than someone says, I need to be on your project because it's me. That doesn't really work for me. So in the end of the day, it's a teamwork. So then the idea that comes to me needs to be, in my case, commercially viable, meaning it has to be sold to a buyer in the US that could be a streamer, a network, and or a studio. That's the one side of things. But it also has to be sellable to the international audience. So the US for me really stands for only a third of the money that I'm making back on the worst case scenario. The international market is much more important to me as an investor. So that's why the th subject matters they have to be global, globally viable. So I'm gonna have a harder time doing something that is maybe about baseball or any kind of sports in the US because I have a harder time selling that internationally. But in the US, it could be sold fantastically. Now, unless someone tells me, okay, we're giving you 80% of the budget, like Hulu or any buyer here, I would say, okay, fine, let's look at this. But it's harder. So the subject matters have to be globally viable. For example, thriller, action, um, um, horror. I don't really know how to do horror. I'll, I'll, even though it makes a lot of money, I'm not into horror at all. Sorry about that, guys. But thriller action for sure. Comedy, if it's strong, if it's globally viable. I like elevated art house too, meaning a really strong story. Like, for example, Coda would be a movie that I would have made, even though it's not really fitting a genre per se. It's not thriller, it's not action, which is what I usually do. This is a beautiful movie that is satisfying. So something that is brought to me with a satisfying story where it just, it's just a feel good story. So those things I can do. And when it's when we talk about budget ranges, anything from like 
three to maybe 15 in that range million dollars um, I can do, but it has to have some kind of known cast component to it. And we're helping with that. So I don't need the producer to come to me and say, well, how am I going to attach this cast without money? Because I need your money first, and then I need to go make that pay or play offer. We'll do that together. If the idea is there, I'm willing to come on board and help package this with actors, with good lawyers like David, with good people to make it all happen. That I will do, but it needs to start with someone who is open, who is a sponge, and lets me be a sponge just as well to mold the idea to the best it can be. So really just be be open and, and just understand the teamwork process. That's kind of where I'm coming from. And I, I and I invite another thing to just say, and you guys know this because you're all teaching, the different perspectives that we get from our students in these classes are mind blowing to me. I, I welcome and I invite these kind of different perspectives, even on stuff that I work on. I work on this TV show that I mentioned earlier. I sent it to all my students and said, give me feedback, what do you think? And I'm getting great comments and I love it. So it's not that I know everything. I don't know everything. And I will never pretend I know everything. I have to figure this out every time I do a new project. But that's where we all are. We have to kind of figure it out. And um, knowing some people is helpful, but we all start in the same plane. We just have to work our way through yeah. the green light. I love it. And I have a question I want to read. It's it's lengthy, but we'll get to it. Um, and I think we might have to wrap it up because we're going to get kicked out of here at 315. This is the question. It's got a little setup. There's no denying that streaming platforms have gained significant traction in the past few years. No denying. Do you think the practice of watching movies at movie theaters or the weekly episodic format of cable TV or broadcast will find its way back? I work in broadcast. I can answer that. Will it outweigh the popularity of the streaming platforms and the binge watching it facilitates? Further, should streaming platforms remain popular and rule the market because it's more lucrative for all stakeholders or vice versa? So let's talk about streaming and its impact. That, let's close out on that because it's opened such a completely different world. What do you each think about that or thoughts on that idea? Well, we had, I actually started talking about that. So it's a great kind of bookend. And um, I'll just, we got a couple of seconds. So I'll just make it really quick. And this is what I've heard from the best and most powerful people in Hollywood down the hallways over the years is content is king. That's it. You have good content, doesn't matter if it's on a streamer, if it's on a broadcast, if it's a movie, people are gonna see it if it's good. And if it's not, they're not. They're not. And that's what everyone right now is looking for. That's why there's been a bit of a pullback with all the OTTs and streaming platforms with them looking over their strategies and really trying to figure things out. I think Apple has probably been a bit ahead of the game of really having a very tightly curated um, collection of content, whereas Netflix has kind of exploded and everyone else has tried to keep up and it's led to this avalanche of material and now no one knows where to find anything. Um, so I think we're going to see, unfortunately, for producers, uh, a bit more consolidation. We're going to see a lot more projects that are going to be based on, good for me, books um, and based on underlying content that people then can build off of. And, um, you know, as for crystal ball, you know, anyone who's ever made any prediction about where streamers are right now have been horribly wrong. You know, I remember when this discussion first started, it was like, oh, people are only going to have an appetite for paying for maybe two streamers along with their cable package. Now everyone's got like six or seven and you're renewing subscriptions and then canceling them. And it's a huge headache and you get in fights with your wife or your husband or significant other about why do you need all this stuff, you know, but it's that's kind of where we're at. And I think the industry right now is is going to be a bit of a trial by error. But when it comes down to it, you know, when there's really good content, like you look at you look at Peacock and Yellowstone, right? That was what put them on the map. That's why suddenly people started signing up for Peacock is because this Kevin Costner show was so fantastic. I mean, I had friends go to me and say, David, I know you don't want to pay for another streamer, but if you pay and you watch this show and you don't like it, I'm going to reimburse you the cost of your subscription fee. I had three different people, four or three, four, whatever, three or four people in the industry on separate occasions tell that to me. And that's the kind of thing that's driving all these platforms and what they're going to have to keep on finding in order for them to sustain themselves and be relevant. Kate? Uh, ooh, that's a tricky question. Uh, in a nutshell, I, I think it's, it's, it's 
that's a it's yeah it's a little tricky i think i agree uh i think streamers aren't going anywhere um i think at the moment like literally right now they're struggling just a little bit i think the netflix news was was tough at the beginning of the year uh with the ratings drop but um you know i think that they have a little bit of of gaining their audience's trust back they they keep kind of canceling shows you know they're getting their fans invested in season one and then they're canceling shows left and right which i know has been a bit of a problem because i think fans are a little bit tired of investing um their their time and and wanting to see a season two and um you know uh, broadcasters used to develop their show on the air uh, for for seasons and now i think streamers have started to do that with 10 episodes uh and then but you can't really do that because fans really want to know what's going to happen in episode one season two and i think that that's really kind of started to to, to turn audiences a little bit um so but i that that's that, that's fixable and i think that, that that's starting to turn streamers to a different form, way of development and which i think david has tapped into a little bit um but i think we're going to see a big adjustment in terms of how the streamers are developing uh so i think but i do think broadcast is going to see a bit of a comeback um with procedurals and sitcoms and stuff like that if i was to have my crystal ball out uh so we'll just you know but i don't think streamers are going anywhere right 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 jeanette quickly closing remarks from you and then no quickly closing remarks i think my my prediction is for what it's worth i think that they're going to be a little bit of consolidation because there are a lot of streamers out there i do think to kate's point i think we're going to see that television is, is coming back maybe a little bit i also think that netflix is already changing their model they're doing advertising so there's that um you know i think that for us as content providers and financiers and content creators it's exciting no matter what happens that's my closing remark that is exactly right. Noemi, final word before I got to say some stuff about the festival. Final word is plastics. Um, look up the graduate. Uh, since that's not my specialty to predict these things, I think streamers are not going anywhere, but that's not my specialty though. And um, I would just end on the idea that uh, whatever I really like the idea of the IP content, how important that is, and to, um, you know, in whatever format you're going to develop your work, um, look for that underlying source material. Um, I think that's a great thing for, for all of us to, to think about. Like, look at books and interesting stories that we can, um, you know, develop, and um, and just tell great stories. Yep. And with unique, like find your authentic voice, take classes at UCLA Extension. Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> Excellent idea. Speaking of this, we have to wrap this up. Apparently, I've been giving some messages here saying wrap it up. Uh, this concludes our, our 2022 Film Festival panel that we're hosting. Thank you so much to Kate, Jeanette, Noemi, and David. Very, very much. Excellent. I could have done this for hours with you. You guys are great. And uh, those of you that are signed on, hope you got something out of it. Please kick over to the festival, uh, the awards ceremony, which starts at 3.30 today. So that's 17, I'm sorry, 13 minutes away from right now. And that will be followed by a virtual networking event. And you heard how important networking is right here. Uh, so that's at four o'clock. So do some networking and bring your dog. David, dogs are loud. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining the panel. Thank you for the four panelists for moving with my lack of preparation with my questions, but really loved each and everything you guys shared. I'm serious when I say I got so many notes. It was really, really wonderful. And I know they got something out of it. So thank you all very, very much for being here. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.